Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm not mic'd up, so is, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I'll talk louder if I need to. Thank you for coming. I see some uh, familiar faces. How many here know about the CCC or are familiar with the CCC? Anybody have relatives in the CCC? Wow, okay. Well listen, we have a very special guest with us today, Jay Hendrickson. Most of you know him, I think, or some of you do at least, I know. Jay is from Hill City. Uh, Jay was a CCC man, uh, mostly at Camp Mystic. We're gonna show just a short film uh, with some fe uh, some fellas that uh, spoke at the uh, little CCC Museum grand opening in 2009, of which Jay was there. Actually, Jay was instrumental in getting our little museum started. After we show the, the little film, Jay's going to say a few words, tell us a little bit about his experience, and if you have any questions, and Troy, do you want to do you want to? Pass the clipboards out now, or do you want to do that later? We'll grab those uh, as you guys start. Okay. Them. We'll make okay. questions. Our clipboards available. If you have if you have questions, please write them down, uh, and, and we'll bring them up and we'll we'll read them out loud so everybody can hear them, and Jay will answer them. <laughs> He's got all the answers. <laughs> okay. Let, let me just show you this little uh, this little clip real quick. This won't take long. So we'll turn the lights down for the video here, guys, so don't run out of your chairs. Something good came up. It's called the CCC. And the story said it was but uh, all dry and no crops on the farm. I lived on the farm and my dad just turned 17, graduated from high school, and signed up for the CCs. We only got $5 a month to, to work with. There was no, no jobs we had. Cut last back in the 30s. And if you can find any CC, you see, he's crawling. I joined up in April 1939 and, and was discharged in 1940, end of March. I was inducted in July of 39. And when I was in the CC camp in the fall of 38 and the spring of 39. I signed up for the CC and that was in 1934. There was no crops, and so there was no work. Gee, I was on a farm back then. I hated farm work. So I decided I was going to get off the farm. I had nothing to do. And here I'm about 16, 17 years old, and CC program was already on. So I made an application as a local experienced man at 16. So you can imagine that. And, uh, I was accepted and put, I was first camp was at Camp Mystic Hill on the Mystic Road. I lived on a farm and uh, went to grade school and country and high school and city. Well, we did a lot of tree thinning and uh, planted trees for I don't know how, how long there. We fixed trails that were washed out over the winter so that they could drive in there and, and work in different areas. We built the Cicero Peak Tower from day one clear up. We built a platform probably 20 feet square and mixed the concrete with shovels on that. And it was <laughs> a little different from the days now. When I first come, I worked in the woods, sending trees. Right, uh, uh, hook axe and uh, double big axe, and we were sending trees. But then the first weekend, when I found out you were in the woods, you could get on KP, which I did, and I had to clean grease traps that first weekend, which was a nasty job. That fall, we started Bob Marshall 
modernization camp, which is by Bismarck Lake, and that's where I started my missionary work. And I worked on that. Then in, during the winter, we had, uh, well, there was always thinning and pruning and that type of thing to do. My mother was a good cook, so I knew how to cook a little bit, so I, I, I applied to be a cook. Well, I had to get up real early and it worked the way late at night, washing dishes, cleaning the mopping floor. Started out building rooms and then I got to drive the truck, which Everybody wanted to drive a truck, you know, and uh, for some reason that young kid gave me the power for driving a big truck. I was born in a farm near Mackley, South Dakota, uh, north of the Missouri River, in there, in uh, 1921. After you graduated from high school, um, did you plan to go to college, get a job, work? Uh, that was during the Depression years, and I did not have one dime. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided to join the CCC camp, which a lot of young men did, and uh, because we had to have some sort of income. And that gives us uh, an income of $30 a month. Our group was decided to rush more for about 30 days at a time. And mm -hmm. Maybe we'd go to Wind Cave, maybe we'd go to Harney Peak. Uh -huh. On your worker's card that I have in my office, yeah. um, it had, you know, the CCCs, and um, and on there it had the E-Hall drill bits. Yes. So you had, you had to sharpen those about four, three, four times a day. Yeah. And that hard rock the ramp. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had to take it down to the building, and the old gentleman would be sharpening, and mm -hmm. all back up again, uh -huh. and climb those stairs. And and sometimes there were 700 feet of stairways there. I went to when your high school? Uh, I went through the eighth grade, and that was the end of my education. And on the whole, there were many Indian uh, uh, <clears throat> rollies uh, who were illiterate at the time, and there were many, many schools set up for, for them to, to work. Uh, uh, Learn the language and learn English and reading and writing, arithmetic, doing that time on our off hours. We were desperate, you know, at that time. And uh, uh, it was a chance to get out and make a few dollars. And uh, we, I come in, you know, it wasn't much, we got 30 dollars a month. So three and a half million. Uh, a man that were in the heaven court during that period of time, you know, that was, that was a lot of money. I uh, sent home to families around the, all, the, all the United States and even Alaska and Hawaii, Puerto Rico and Guam at that time. So we had camps in all those uh, places. And we got to keep four dollars, uh, five dollars we got back, but we had to get 25 cents to the government for our laundry. So we only had four hours and seventy-five cents to spend. Uh, there were eight, eight of us children, and, and uh, the family was happy to get by uh, twenty-five dollars a month for for their subsistence, and also helped out with the uh, uh, in the community. When they go to town and spend a lot of that money, so they help help the community in addition to the family. You see, it seems to be thirty dollars a month, and of course that. I get to keep five hours. Went back to the farm. My dad rented more ground, so I thought I needed to use more help at home. And then after that, I went to a, a, a sheet metal school in Wichita. And then so I completed that school and Boeing hired me as a sheet metal specialist. And that brought a good to show before I got up the seat. And I. I, I think I had to go to school for 35 years. <laughs> I've followed this trade, the masonry trade, for practically the rest of my life. And the CC training that I had as leadership in there, as well as the masonry, I used that for many, many years. And I always had a crew working for me. And we built the cathedral and 
probably probably schools and Rapid City. And, the CCs were the big thing for me. I thought it was great. I never did forget it. But I learned a lot. I think that <clears throat> my first uh, uh, trip away from home, so it was a chance to meet other people. We learned how to get along and to accept. Uh, we couldn't have our way down and uh, got along very well, I thought. And it was a, a wonderful experience for us young people. And if you can find any CC, he's proud of that he got to be part of it. It would be nice if, if there was some way that the younger people could experience something like that, you know. It was an apt lifesaver for us, an apt step to learn to cope with life and, and uh, I was happy to be it. short years, they completely overhauled Wind Cave National Park, creating an infrastructure that is still used to showcase the cave and the prairie world above it. Reminders of their work are many. Their legacy includes buildings such as the visitor center and elevator building, the concrete stairs in the cave, and the trees which landscape the headquarters area. The CCC was a program that benefited individuals, transformed the areas where they were, and helped the country in a time of crisis. Wind Cave National Park was forever changed by these young men who laid the foundation for the park we enjoy today.
we, we could have included a lot more, but we didn't want people to fall asleep. So we, we, we shut it off. They'll there. fall asleep when I'm talking. No, they won't. No, they won't. <laughs> they did so much here in the Black Hills, and, and I, I, I think it's important that we remember the, the work that these guys did, and they did a lot, and, and uh, it's just amazing. It, it's all over the place, all over the country, uh, but here in the Black Hills, uh, you can't go anywhere without finding something that these guys uh, uh, built. And so uh, I, I'm real tickled to, to have gotten to know Jay. Uh, Peggy Sanders is somewhere in the uh, audience here. Peggy, uh, actually Peggy, I, I, her book is what sort of got me interested in this, al although I do have to say, I don't know if Zane Martin's here. Zane Martin is the chief interpreter, uh, the uh, museum specialist at Mount Rushmore, and she's the one that got me interested in making the connection between the Mount Rushmore workers and the CCC. And that's, in fact, she's the, uh, she's the, uh, the first time I went to the little museum in Hill City was with Zane Martin, so she deserves the, or the blame, however you want to look at it. Jay, uh, would you like to say a few words? Tell us a little bit about your experience in the, in the CCC, and then if you have any questions, uh, please write them down and, and bring them up, and, and uh, we'll get Jay to, to answer them. And Kinsey's got clipboards, so just wave at her. Yeah, but our ideas I'd like to say something. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought maybe with this video here that you would get a good idea of what was going on with the CCs, but I'd like to kind of take you through the, a camp. So uh, in uh, 33, when <coughs> President Roosevelt was inaugurated in, on March the 4th, he already had some CC camps started on the first part of April, three weeks ahead. So I'd like to a CC camp, when he had set them up, he designated the army to run the camps. And the reason that was, was the army had a bunch of reserve officers to manage the camps. They also had a bunch of old clothing from World War I that they gave us to wear. They had uh, some trucks and various all kinds of equipment that we could use. They had tents to set up the tent camps to get started. And they also, the United States was divided into core areas. And this happened to be the seventh core area that we were in. And that was each core area had a headquarters that administrated these camps. Each camp was set up to accommodate 200 men. And they had a company commander, much the same as the Army. They had a first officer. They had a, 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 a let's see, they had, yeah, they had a first officer, and then they had a medical officer in every camp to take care of your medical needs. They had a first sergeant. They had a mess sergeant. And it was, the camp was run on strictly on, on Army standards. A typical day in the Army, when you got up in the morning at 6 o'clock, you had reveille, much the same as the Army, to be counted, make sure you hadn't gone to AWL. And then, then the next thing you, you always had was, was you had a uh, uh, <coughs> breakfast call. And then during that same time, you had sick call. If you happen to be sick, have a cold or something, you can go to the dispensary. Each camp had a dispensary. Um, then you had, after that, you had your breakfast call. And you went to breakfast. And I can say that the food in the CC camps were extraordinary, especially for some kids that hadn't been eating regularly and they get in there and they have a real full meal and it was really something to see. Uh, it's been said that in the first six months they gained from 10 to 15 pounds individually from the food they got. Uh, then uh, after 
you had your breakfast, you had work call. And at work call, you were released to whatever outfit was going to do the, supervise the work. And in the hills, mostly, it was the Forest Service. And out on the plains was either the Bureau of Reclamation or the Department of Interior. Uh, you leave camp at about 8 o'clock and travel to whatever job that you were going to do with by truck. And then you would work until noon. You had a little time off for noon. And you tried to be back in camp at 4 o'clock. And after that, you had your time was on your own before supper, of course. And uh, then you could, each camp also had an educational advisor in the camp. And his duties was to teach whatever, a lot of the kids that came weren't very literate, you know, they, they were having problems. So they taught whatever, they taught typing, they taught uh, automobile mechanics, they taught uh, welding. They taught any, if a group of the kids thought of something they wanted to learn, they could go to this educational advisor and he would set up a class. And those classes would generally run from about seven to nine at night. And uh, I took uh, automobile mechanics and welding when I was there, which really came in handy in later life. I can still remember the firing order of an old Chevrolet truck after all these years. They didn't, uh, they also, besides your, your education, they didn't forget your, your uh, uh, church. Every, every Sunday they made sure that you had a church to go to, a uh, truck to go to church in town. And they took care of that. And also each camp had a lot of athletics. Some camps had baseball teams and some had basketball teams. And boxing team, boxing was a big thing in camps. And they went to other camps and uh, worked there with them. Uh, I don't know. A lot of, I went in, when I went into, into the CC camp, I was 16 years old, and I told him I was 18. But uh, that was 80 years ago that I went into CC camp. So it, I did, some things I can't remember, and most things I can. But I, it, my experience in the camp was nothing but good. The boys there, they were mostly all, I don't remember of anything like drugs or anything like that. There was nothing like that. We, all got along, we learned to live with each other, we learned many things, and uh, it helped. Well, those well, people around there, I knew all of those was on the, on the video, and most of those were very, very influential people in their, in their lifetime. I guess if that's, if, I would entertain some questions. Shane, we've got just a few. We've got a few here, <laughs> and uh, we probably won't get through all, but we're gonna we're gonna try. Uh, they want to know what was your favorite project? Oh, Robe Lake. I guess I worked on Robe Lake, and that, that was one of my favorite projects. And uh, also, I hauled rock to the Silver Lake Lodge to help build the Silver Silver Lake Lodge. That was, I think, my favorite, one of my favorite pro projects. What was your worst experience? <laughs> uh, why would you ask that? <laughs> I didn't have too many worst experiences. Um, I had a lot of experience, a lot of things we did. I'm trying to think. Oh, I was in Roadway Lake and I couldn't swim. And I was, one of the guys helped drag me out, and uh, that's probably one of my worst experiences. <laughs> uh, were most of the fellas in your camp from South Dakota, or were they from 
around the United States. The set, like I said, the seventh core area was Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. So we had people in our camps in the hills, in the hills from all three states. We had a lot of them from North Dakota and a lot of them from Nebraska. And uh, that's about all. I, I don't think we had anybody from Minnesota, as I remember. Here's a question from, uh, I recognize this name. I don't see, oh, there she is. Uh, this is from, from, uh, from Patsy Anderson. Did I get your name right? Patsy's dad was in, uh, was from Dupree, and he was in Camp Mystic from 1935 to 1936. Did you know him? No, because I didn't get there until 37. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what was his what is his name, Anderson? No, uh, 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 Beverly Woodward. From Woodward. Woodward. Woodward was the last name. And, and if I remember right, we looked on, our, on, our, on the roster, we didn't find his, his name, but we, uh, she's, got the, uh, she's got the information that we need to add. And that brings up a good point. We have uh, an ongoing project at the museum. We have collected somewhere over 20,000 names we publish it, uh, we publish the roster uh, once a year generally, and it never fails after we publish it. We have new names that come in. We just published another one, we got 20,000 some names and we've had some new ones come in since then. Uh, there were about 31,000 men that served in South Dakota from 1933 to 1942. And like I say, we're, we're over 20,000. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but always adding names. So if you know of anybody, if you've had any relatives, if you want to find out, let us know at the museum. We'll look it up on the uh, database of names. And if we don't have the name of your relative, we'll, we'll help you uh, find the information that you need. You can write to the National Archives. We'll do some research ourselves. And because we want to get as many of these men uh, recorded in that in that roster as we possibly can here in South Dakota. Uh, a couple more. How were the men paid? In oh. cash or did they get a check or what did you do? They're paid in cash. Every they had a pay line every month that you had to go through the pay line and if you had any outstanding debts to the company, they'd take it out but you got cash every every month. And incidentally, the pay, you don't sound very good at this day and age. We got a dollar a day, $30 a month, and $25 of that month they sent home to your family. And that helped support, I suppose, in those days, I, I would imagine $25 would feed a family of four in those days. $30 a month. Here's a question. I don't know the answer to this. I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we brought the air on. <laughs> what was Camp 5 near Galena used for and for how long? Camp 5 near Galena was a, it was a World War I veterans camp at Galena. And I didn't mention that, but there was also camp, camp set up for veterans. There was throughout the World War I veterans. And that, that was a, at Galena. I've been to almost all the camps. When I was uh, transferred from Mystic, I went to Roe Bay, and I was there for a while. And then I was transferred up to Fort Meade, and I was in a headquarters detachment up there and one of our jobs was to drive inspectors around to the different camps through the hills in the state. So I got to drive those inspectors. So I got to go to practice every camp in the state. So that was quite an experience for me. How did the how did they move the big stones at the Norbeck building in Custer State Park? <laughs> I wasn't there, but I would assume that they, uh, that, that's the one that, the, that they converted now into something else, didn't they? Uh, 
you had trucks and they had some gin poles that they used. You know, everybody knows what a gin pole is. It's just pulled up with guy wires on it and it's got an arm out there with a lock and tackle on it and you can pick up stuff and swing it around. I imagine where they quarried those rocks, they used that to load them on a truck and a similar thing to unload them. Here's a, uh, I'll let you answer this and I'll comment afterwards. It said, work on the Harney Peak must have been difficult. Everything would have been hauled to the, uh, carried to the top. Is that right? Do you, can you give us That's true. They used horses and they had a half of a 55 gallon barrel that would fill up with a barrel with sand and mortar and, and stuff like that and drag it up there and also lumber or whatever the hell they had they had to and also when the cc was working up there they had to carry a load up every morning they had to take out they had to load, put some lumber on their back and stuff it was a, it was quite a project jay answered the question but along the lines of those barrels I, and i think on our website there's some photographs of where they took those barrels and they put uh, axles under yeah, they had it. and they would hook them behind horses just like a chariot and haul them up the, uh, up, haul them up the mountain. It, it must have been rude work. Uh, here's a question. How would you find out what skills our father learned while there? And I, I can't read the name, but, but thank you for the question. I'm a woodwork too. Okay. <laughs> well, Many skills, they learned many, many skills. First of all, how to get along with your neighbor and, and uh, how to be a gentleman in the most of the time. They learned a lot of things like that. And they worked in the woods, so you learned to use a double bedded ax and not cut your foot. That was a skill too. They also learned uh, uh, how to uh, uh, drive a truck, for instance. A lot of people never drove a truck. And actually, the truck, truck drivers were the best job in the camp. They learned uh, uh, numerous things. If you want to learn specific information about a relative, we have a form, I think and it's on the website too, but we have at the museum. You can write to the National Archive, give them as much information about the individual. They will do the research. And oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes in that, in that research, they will find uh, possibly a certificate that they earned at, at a particular class or what their particular job was at a camp. Doesn't I can think of another couple. Uh, learn to cook. If you wanted to become a cook, you could uh, get in the kitchen and, and uh, Miss Sergeant would teach you how to cook and make pies, all kinds of stuff like that. That's another thing to learn. To type, you learn to type if you wanted to be a typist. You could learn to be an auto mechanic like I did. And you learn to be a welder. There was anything you wanted to learn in there, they would attempt to teach you. Was Legion Lake one of the CCC projects? You or bet. You bet. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There was a Legion Lake down there. There was a, a Stockade, Legion, Bismarck, Center, uh, all those lakes in the park were all CC projects. One thing I generally mention is before the CCs showed up in the, in the hills, there was only one, one lake in the hills, and that was Sylvan Lake, which was a little recreational lake. Lake was built by somebody from Custer. But just imagine all those lakes that you saw in the pictures, you know, everything that I think there was at least 12 or 14 major lakes that the CCs built. Uh, they didn't build uh, Deerfield and they didn't build Pactola, but they worked on, even even uh, in Rapid here, they even worked on Canyon Lakes and rebuilt the spillways on it. So. Any other questions? There's one there. Was, was there a specific enrollment period or could you just enroll for any length of time. When you enrolled, what you, how long did you enroll for? Oh, the enrollment was for six months. But you had to sign up every six months and you 
supposedly it would stay for a maximum of two years, but you could sign up those times. You even took an oath when you went in there. Much the army, much like the army, you know. The only thing you didn't have to do, you didn't have to salute the officers, so. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I might mention that, as far as I'm concerned, it helped me all through my life, especially when I went in the army. Uh, when I went in the army in six, about six weeks after I was in the army, they made me a corporal. And in six months, I was a sergeant. In about a year, I was a, was a uh, staff sergeant. And then they sent me to OCS to officers training schools. So I think it was all that, they had all your records, I'm sure. And they knew you had some training. And just to add to that, uh, the CCC lost its funding because of World War II. Yeah. And a lot of those men that were in the Civilian Conservation Corps across the country went into the military. And because they were familiar with that structure, did quite well and, and uh, contributed to the success of nothing. Actually, the there were some camps that the whole camp joined the Army. With a multitude of projects, who directed what needed to be done? And were any of the camps ever idle? <laughs> uh, I might uh, tell you that, you know, we talk about the CCs building all these things and around the hills and around the country and doing all these big dams and all that. Well, it's hard to believe that an 18 year old boy could go out and build a, a huge dam. So they had a lot of help. They really had a lot of help. They uh, hired uh, outside people, contractors, and stuff to guide them. Like a, you can't believe that they could build a pig tail bridge over there on Iron Mountain Road, you know. But they fur what they furnished was actually the labor on all those projects. And uh, I don't believe that there's any camps that were idle. They were always full. There was always, I suppose there was, the way they were recruited was through county boards, like the labor boards in the county, the county commissioners. And I was recruited from the, with a, from a forest ranger. He recruited me. But uh, there was a lot of, I think it was a backlog most all the time. I think in the last years, in probably it did slack off with someone. Now, this is a tough question. Oh, I got the answer. <laughs> it says, what is the most important thing to know about the CCC? I think that the things they done, the leg legacy they left, you know, uh, the impact they had on each individual young man, it was enormous. Uh, uh, I don't know this. I always kind of end up a little thing in, in, in my, my opinion, which probably hasn't worked much, but in my opinion, in those nine years that the CCs were in existence, they did more for the for the conservation of this country that was ever done before the CCs, and for that matter, probably was never done since. I, I do believe that. It is pretty amazing. Any other questions? Which camp had the uh, sawmill? Which camp had the sawmill? Well, there was, there was uh, Rochford, uh, Camp 1790 had the sawmill. My father, then the camp my father worked at the sawmill. Moved to camp uh, Mystic after that. They moved those camps around a lot for some reason. I don't know why. Give them something to do, I guess. But I think in in uh, closing, I'll make a couple of comments. We have a, a little uh, board here with uh, the names of the primary camps and some of the projects that they did. It's far from a complete uh, a listing of what they did. We wouldn't have enough room in, in the theater here for that. But you're certainly welcome to come up, take a look at that, 
shake hands with Jay. If you have any questions, uh, he'll, he'll do his best to answer them. I know he will. And One thing I might add that uh, when I went in there, there were 17 camps in the hills. Each camp had 200 men, and you fit, add, that, add that up, you got 3,400 men that you can do things with, and you can get a lot done, even it was with a pick and shovel or something. At first, that's all they had was pick and shovels to do. Then later on, they got some machinery. Okay, so would everybody, please, let's give Jay. conversation with questions and answers just so you guys all know I don't know if Otto mentioned but we're we're we're, we're we're providing a tape of this so that we've got a little bit of oral history here being gathered today too and we think that's really important um, I didn't get to jump out here at the start in case you don't know me I'm Trey Kilpatrick the executive director but Jay, thank you Jay for being here today um, Peggy Sanders is here too as part of the members of, of the board of directors. Otto is president of the CCC Museum. They're up in Hill City, okay? So you guys go find them up there. I mean, you're charging nothing to come see that's them. That's right. right. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're trying to be here at the Journey but Museum and Learning Center. Donate. Is a is a great partner for all of us. Yeah, you leave the money right here. <laughs> all right, I'll stop taking money. <laughs> For a bit. All right. But I mean, I want Peggy has generously said that she would sign uh, uh, books today. We have books on hand. And this is the Civilian Conservation Corps. It's got a lot of details that we probably, as Otto mentioned, we couldn't cover it all. So, um, and then just as some upcoming programming notes for all of you guys. Some of you, I see you have been here previously. Turtle Soup on Friday was crazy. We had 72 people come to Turtle Soup. We ran out of soup. Reserve ahead of time so that we can make sure we have enough soup for this coming Friday. Richard Ellsworth, we're going to tell his story in the Wild Blue Yonder exhibit because we're going up to Veterans Day weekend. So it's appropriate to honor Ellsworth and to know about Richard Ellsworth. And then next Sunday, we'll also do the history of Ellsworth Air Force Base. We're going to have the superintendent from Minutemen. Uh, missile site, Eric Leonard will be here. Uh, we're going to cover some of the highlights of 75 years at Ellsworth next Sunday. Your admission today gets you into the museum, but as Otto and Jay mentioned, they'll hang around. Peggy's here. You guys, thank you all for your support today and thank you for being here. cards here too if anybody would like to uh, see what our address is, our website address and also our email address. If you have any questions, send us an email or by all means stop at the museum. Thank you. Thank you.